Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation's very first live webinar. It's really exciting to be using this new technology. Please bear with me, it really is very new to me at least. Um, we've chosen the subject of risk, which seems very appropriate on many levels. Thanks to all of you who are joining us live. Please keep your questions coming. We're going to go to as many of them as we possibly can during the event. Uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Now, when we think about risk, the emotion that we think of most is fear. We've evolved as a species to be able to act in times of extreme fear, to make very rapid decisions based on our um, perceived danger. At the same time, we've got the phrase calculated risk, the idea that we can use our intellectual abilities to add up the probability of risk. So today we're going to be looking at a lot of questions. What has science discovered about how we process risks? Is taking risk necessary, even useful? What's the price of getting risk wrong? As the kinds of risk we face get more and more complex, are our old mechanisms still fit for purpose? And perhaps above all, can we learn to evolve, to get better? I've got a terrific panel with me today. Professor Paul Slovic from the University of Oregon and Decision Research is one of the absolute world leaders in the psychology of risk. Professor Tali Sharot, who I'm not sure if we still have, is director of the Effective Brain Laboratory at London's University College and researches the wonderfully named optimism bias. And Alison, Alice Morrison is a professional adventurer. She's been called Indiana Jones for girls and she takes risks for a living. Now, I'd like to start by asking you all the same question. And um, my question is briefly, if there's one key point about risk that you'd like the audience to bear in mind over the next hour, what would it be? And Paul, I wonder if I could start with you. Yes, uh, thank you. So I would say that uh, the key point is that we think about risk in, in two ways, uh, a fast, intuitive uh, way that relies on our, our gut feelings to kind of uh, help us uh, evaluate and, and respond to risk, as opposed to slow, calculated uh, way of thinking that uses uh, data, science, statistics, reason, reason and logic. And both of these uh, ways of thinking are remarkably sophisticated and, and effective uh, until they go wrong. And they both uh, 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 fail us in certain ways. So those of us who study this try to understand when we can trust our feelings, when we can trust uh, the analysis, uh, and how to blend these two ways of thinking for making optimal decisions. I think that for me, that's a key, uh, key thing we have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thanks. And, and Tally, if, if you're there, um, can you tell me uh, what, what you would like the audience to bear in mind? Hi, yes, I'm Hi, here. Fantastic. I couldn't uh, see you. Okay, you see me now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, what I think is fascinating about risk is that how subjective our perception and understanding of risk is. I can tell two people that their risk of being infected by COVID is 20% and their risk of dying from COVID is less than 1%. But one person will take away that they have an extremely high risk, you know, of, of getting COVID and being severely ill. And the other person will take away that they're actually not at risk at all. And this depends on people's personality. Are they, do they have an optimistic tendency, a pessimistic tendency? It depends on their age. It depends on their mental state at the time. Are they very stressed because they had an argument with their partner? Um, so all of these things really change the way that we perceive stress as that we perceive risk. And so you can have the same data in front of you, but perceive it in very different ways. Thank you. And Alice, how about you? What's well, I think risk. Yeah. I think risk is a muscle. So I think you can learn to be brave. I think you can train yourself. I think, given the right exercise and nutrition regime, you can grow that muscle a little bit to take more risks. Um, I think, though, risk has a negative and a positive connotation. And what we always want to do is take those positive risks and not those crazy, stupid, negative risks. But I have found that certainly in my own case 
Um, if I can't take a positive risk, I'm still up for taking a negative one. I like the free fall feeling. So I am looking forward to what Tally and Paul have to teach me. Yes, I hope they will not be too severe upon you. Um, well, <laughs> anyway, talking about risk, I'm very lucky to be in a very, very rural area. And that does mean, and I know Alice is also in a very remote area. That does mean that um, uh, our internet connections are very shaky. So we thought doing a live webinar would be a terrific idea. Um, so, so we're crossing our fingers about the internet connections. Um, Actually, for me, I used to work in television. It now feels like what I saw of the very first days of television, you know, back in the days of black and white. Um, uh, it's it's exciting. It's liberating. I sort of know, Alice, what you mean about the free fall theory, uh, feeling of, of taking a risk. Um, and on a broader level, in terms of risk and society right now, it feels as though we're living through an age of really unprecedented, strange all-encompassing risk that we don't quite understand um, and whether or not that's true I'm sure we're going to go into but that's certainly what a lot of people's intuition is telling them at the moment and while that causes quite a lot of stress uh, it also causes me some optimism Tally because here we all are in different parts of the world and suddenly it's possible for us all to chat to each other from our living rooms. So I, I find it quite refreshing in a way. Um, and I'm very, very lucky um, to have uh, Professor Paul Slovic in his living room, uh, all the way in, you're in Oregon, are you? Uh, yes, Eugene, all the way Oregon. In Oregon. And uh, Paul is, I've come to realize a very, very modest man. So um, I have to um, explain that every time I've been doing interviews with people over the last few days, research, people have been saying to me, Paul Slovic, oh my God, you've got him, he's a guru. So, <laughs> so you really are one of the absolute top researchers in the field of, of, of psychology of risk. And um, I would love you, please, to just for a completely non-technical audience, just to outline some of the key findings that you found over a lifetime of research into how we assess risk. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to be here uh, today with all of you um, to explore this uh, fascinating topic. Uh, I uh, got drawn into it uh, in 1959, believe it or not, by a uh, uh, professor that I was working with, I started to study, uh, uh, he was studying gambles, not because he was interested in gambling per se, but he used a gamble as a representative uh, of uh, the risk we face in life, an abstract representative, things that, uh, because it has some chance of gain, some chance of loss, some amount to win, some amount to lose. So we started manipulating these gambles in an experimental laboratory to see how people combined uh, thinking about probability and payoff when evaluating risk. And over the years, we uh, then extended that work uh, uh, to uh, beyond the laboratory to life's uh, real gambles, which uh, are uh, very complex and, and obviously we need to, uh, to deal with in, in various ways. Uh, one of the main things we, we found is that, uh, is that risk is a subjective concept, uh, that, is, that is measuring risk is subjective. Danger is real, but when we come to kind of characterize danger by putting the word risk uh, uh, to it and, and thinking about how large or how small is that risk, how acceptable is it, then we're getting into the realm of subjectivity where, where, where values and judgment um, inform how we, how we define and measure risk. So that was an important factor. The other, another thing we, we learned is that, that experts and, and non-experts often disagree with how serious a, uh, a risk is and what to do about it. And uh, early on, the experts used to think that uh, this is because the public didn't know as much as they did about the risk. The public was ignorant and in some cases irrational because they didn't agree with the experts. What we found in our studies was that this was not correct. Certainly, um, the public doesn't, ha doesn't have the same information but they bring into the, their evaluation of risk subjective factors that are related to values that you can't dismiss as due to ignorance or irrationality. By that, I mean they, it makes a difference to people whether they, uh, the risk is under their control or not. 
it makes a difference to people whether there can be a catastrophic consequence or just you know smaller uh, consequences. It makes a difference to people whether whether uh, the 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 harm is done to vulnerable people like children or the elderly as opposed to non-vulnerable. All these things matter to people, and we're being left out of the experts' uh, calculations. And so uh, these things have to be considered uh, when you're, uh, as well as the experts' views, when you're making judgments and decisions. Um, over time, we also came to recognize that, that uh, we judge risk uh, often uh, by our, how we feel about things, that risk is not just a result of a calculation, but it's the result, as I mentioned earlier, about, about, uh, about our uh, feelings. We, we use the technical term affect as a jargon for feelings. And our feelings are like a compass that guide us through the decisions we have to make every day. And this compass is very, very sophisticated. The reason we, we rely on, on, on our feelings to judge risk is because most of the time that works. Uh, it's easy to do, it's natural, it's fast, and it, and it often uh, works for us, except when it doesn't. So uh, some of us then study, well, where does it break down? And one of the ways that our feelings break down is that they can't count. You know, when the scale of a, of a, of a, of a hazard, of, of the consequences uh, increases, we often, our feelings don't follow along and proportionally increase. Uh, and in fact, sometimes they, uh, they uh, uh, actually decrease. We, we, we use a term to capture this, uh, which is the more who die, the less we care. And, uh, uh, can, I, yeah. can I stop you there? Because uh, this is really interesting stuff. This is what you call psychic numbing, that the fact that, can, could you explain that? Uh, yes, we, we, uh, research has uncovered you know, three components that, um, lead us to make uh, mistakes uh, when, we, when we're thinking about risks. And, and psychic numbing is one of them. It's the fact that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that our feelings uh, of care and compassion for, say, some person in need uh, motivate us to act. And those feelings are strongest for a single person. That is, the feeling system is maximized at, at one, your, yourself or someone right in front of you. Uh, or someone that you're reading about in a, in a vivid story, or you see a picture or something like that, that you, we care a lot about individuals. But then think about, you know, now we suppose we have two people in front of us who are in distress. You don't feel twice as uh, concerned as, as you did with if there was just one. You know, the feeling system has kind of a ceiling. And in fact, so for example, that first life, which is very important to us, it loses its value uh, as the number of lives uh, at risk increase. So if I tell you there are 87 people at risk, you'll feel you know, concerned. And then if I say, oh no, it's 88, you won't feel any different, even though there's an extra life, unless you use that slow way of thinking that does the, the arithmetic and says, uh, oh yeah, 88 is one more life and that life is important. You have to kind of work at it to, uh, to appreciate the difference. And sometimes, um, not only do we become insensitive to these large numbers of, uh, 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 of people or creatures at risk, we actually become less sensitive. We become, we start to lose it. So if, you know, the numbers are in the hundreds or the thousands or the millions, they just become numbers. You know, uh, we say that, you know, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. And so you feel less concerned uh, uh, when there's a lot of, uh, when, when, when the risks are the greatest. And that leads us to turn our backs um, uh, uh, towards uh, some of the major problems facing humanity, uh, such as you know uh, warfare and and uh, climate change and and large you know poverty, disease that that happen to millions of people. So I'll stop there. I'm kind of I could you know yeah. ramble on about this. I better stop just right there. We just we think yeah. they're too complicated, or they yeah. throw our valves or something. So just tell me quickly about the arithmetic of compassion. Yes, that's a, a broad term that, we, uh, that captures the fact that when we rely on our feelings uh, to, uh, to motivate us to, to deal with the problems of the world, uh, this, uh, this kind of the arithmetic of feelings uh, is non-rational. You know, it, it, uh, one plus one doesn't equal two. It's, 
sometimes less than two and sometimes less than one in terms of how we feel about that. So, um, uh, and the term comes from a, a, a poem uh, by a Polish poet named Zbigniew uh, Herbert. Uh, who, it was uh, titled, Mr. Kojito Reads the Newspaper. So his character, Mr. Kojito is reading the, the paper and, and on the front page, there's, there's uh, two stories. One is about a, a, a farm worker who murdered someone in his family. Uh, the other one is about uh, 120 soldiers who were killed in a battle, and and Mr. Kojito uh, uh, dwells on the on the on the one person murdered uh, because that captures uh, his attention and is more interesting than the 120. And and what Herbert says uh, at the end, he says, you know, 120, you know, the the the, the zero at the end turns it into uh, an abstraction. You know, you don't. Uh, you don't feel anything about that. He says, uh, a subject for meditation, the arithmetic of compassion. So the, the focus on one versus 120, and, and that captures what we find in experimental studies. It captures what you re recognize when you look around uh, at what's happening in the world where, where we do get to caught up in, in individual stories, uh, which is important, we should do that. But we also are turning our backs on the major threats to humanity and to the environment, yeah. you know, mm. uh, that we should be focusing on. And I am now getting Q&As. My Q&As are coming through now. So I've got one that I'm just going to um, ask you and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, why do feelings become less sensitive? What is it within the human condition that makes them immune to more tragedy? And, and the audience member wonders, can it be reversed or would it be too overwhelming for us? Well, that's certainly a, a fine question. I don't know that we have the full answer to that, but but I think that the the uh, mechanisms in our brain that process feelings are are ancient. I mean, these are these are uh, this is the the way that we survived when we lived in the cave, when we had to react to things that were right in front of us, dangers that were right in front of us. We had to react quickly. We didn't have science and mathematics and statistics. Uh, we just had our gut feelings. And, and, and so, uh, and that part of our brain is still, is still with us. But, but imagine, we, and we find that, that the way our feelings react are much the same way, uh, the way our feelings react to increases in, in numbers of people at risk is the same way that our eyes react to uh, increase levels of, of, of light energy in terms terms of brightness. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, you know, you, in order to have an, uh, a visual system that can see a faint light, uh, it, it has to be so sensitive it, it can see uh, a, a, you know, a little bit of light, uh, but it can't scale up. That is the, the visual system after a while, uh, as you increase the light energy, it doesn't seem any brighter because the system can't handle that. So a system that, that is designed to be sensitive to small things, um, whether it's light or uh, faint sounds or uh, lives, uh, uh, um, it, it can't scale out, scale up, uh, or it breaks the system. Uh, so, so that's the way the feelings uh, are. Fortunately, we have another way of think of thinking that can deal with large numbers without uh, without exploding from the magnitude, and that is our 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 cognition, our our. Uh, way of doing analytic thinking and logic and reason and science, which is, has also evolved over time. Uh, and so now we've got both ways of thinking and we have to learn how to, how to use them both wisely. Learn how to use them both. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. We will come back to a more general discussion, but um, I would love to have a little uh, talk with uh, Professor Tali Shirot uh, first, I think. Uh, um, Tali, you're one of really the top scientists in, in the UK, you're really well known for your discovery of the neural underpinnings of human optimism. And uh, I, I was um, amazed to discover that you literally zap people's brains with magnetic pulses and try to try and find out how our brains are wired up and whether we can change, um, which maybe leads on from uh, uh, Professor Slovic's um, contribution. Um, and incredibly, in the lab, you've managed to switch off temporarily the optimism bias. Can you just start by telling me what is the optimism bias? Um, yeah, so 
The optimism bias is our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of positive events happening to us and underestimate the likelihood of negative events. So in general, most individuals, um, about 80% or so, will underestimate their likelihood of encountering accidents, um, being ill, getting divorced, for example, um, all sorts of risks. And in fact, we see this during the current situation as well. Um, our data, as well as data from many, many other individuals have shown that people tend to believe they're less likely of being infected uh, by COVID than other people their age and gender. So if you take a, a larger representative sample um, of the population and you ask them, are you as likely to get COVID as someone exactly your age and gender or more or less, um, on average, people think they're just a little bit less likely to get COVID than, than others that are similar to them. Um, so that is the optimism bias. And what is interesting um, about it is that it's a little bit odd because where is it coming from? Right. I mean, you experience in life, you experience positive events and you experience negative events. You do get ill. You do get, you know, divorced and you think, oh, the next one is going to stay. Um, and you have positive and negative events and information all the time. We get negative information, positive information. So where is this optimism bias? How, how come it's so resistant? And that is a question that was really um, interesting for me. And what we found was that it's related to how we learn from information. So we tend to learn a little bit better from information that suggests that the risk is lower than we thought. So information that suggests the future is a little bit better than what we expected, then information suggesting that the future is worse. So for example, um, if you, you say, oh, I think there's gonna be 300 participants in, in this webinar. And I say, no, it's gonna be 400. So quickly you would say, oh, well, you, you probably know, then I, I think maybe it's gonna be closer to 400. But if I tell you, you know, I think it's gonna be closer to 200, you will say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I think it's gonna be more than that. So we tend to take in the information that is positive a little bit more than the negative. We learn from it more. And um, when we look at uh, brain activity, we can see that the brain encodes such information better in a few different regions in the brain than information that, that's, that's worse. Now, this is on average. And of course, there's a lot of individual differences, which uh, tend to be quite interesting. One is age. So we find this phenomena of learning more from the bad than the good, Mostly, um, we find that in, in all everyone. However, it's especially uh, dominant in teenagers and kids. So they are not very good at learning from negative information. If you tell a teenager, you know, your risk of dying in a car accident is, is quite high, they tend to relatively ignore it. But also the elderly um, have a huge bias in how they learn from positive and negative. They learn much more from the positive and negative. It's middle age that we see the, the smallest bias people in mid middle age uh, don't have as much bias as others. And we don't know why that is, but one, one thing that we're thinking, one hypothesis is it's the amount of stress that we have. So, you know, when, when I tell you about this phenomena, you may ask, well, that's odd. Why would we learn less from negative than positive? That doesn't seem adaptive, right? We're gonna, we're gonna take risk we shouldn't take. We're putting ourselves in danger. How, how is that a thing that, that's good for our survival? How has it evolved? doesn't make sense. And, it, and, and it's true. And there's different answers to this. So the traditional answer used to be that, well, okay, taking in the positive more than the negative perhaps is, is puts us in danger, but it also has a lot of benefits. It creates a positive outlook at life that reduces your anxiety. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health right? If you think things are going to going to turn out to be quite well. Um, and indeed, all else being equal, optimists tend to survive longer and get over illnesses uh, quicker. Um, and it's good for your motivation. If you think, oh, you know, I can get through this, I can make it, then you try harder, right? So my perception affects my action and my action will affect the outcome. So it can become a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and they say, okay, there's the disadvantages. I take too much risk, that's not good, but there's advantages. Probably the advantages has outweighed the disadvantages. And that is probably true, but not in every environment. If you are in a very threatening environment, lots of risks, animals are coming at you, right? That probably is not a good disposition to have. So what we um, hypothesize, and we've done some experiments too, and we found it to be true, is that you have an optimism bias and you learn a little bit more from positive and negative as long as you're in a relatively relaxed, safe environment 
like we are in today, despite everything that's happening in the world, it's relatively um, low stress. However, if I put you in a very threatening environment, you have a stress reaction in your body that changes the way you process information and you start getting uh, very hypervigilant to negative information. At that point, the optimism bias disappears. And that could be quite adaptive, right? Because if you're in a threatening situation, you don't want to ignore the negative news. So the brain is quite um, effective in that way. It can switch the optimism bias on and off to make it most adaptive to the certain environment that you are in. Fascinating. And speaking as a middle-aged person, that explains a lot. Um, I've got a, a great question come through from Chris in the audience. Uh, he wants to know how much is our optimism bias affected by our surroundings and our tribe? And I know you've also uh, researched what you call confirmation bias as well, haven't you? Yeah, so the confirmation bias is related. The confirmation bias is our tendency to take in information that confirms what we believe more so than information that disconfirms it. Now, often optimism bias and confirmation bias go hand in hand, because often what I believe is also what I want to be true, but not, not always. Sometimes they actually diverge, and that's very interesting. For example, I'll give you an example of a study that was conducted just before the uh, 2016 presidential election in the US. So um, a group of scientists actually in the UK, uh, led by Ryan McKay, asked 1,000 Americans, who do you want to win the election? And who do you think is going to win the election? So back in August 2016, about half wanted Trump to win and half wanted Clinton to win. However, back in August 2016, most people believed that Clinton was going to win, right? Um, and so then they gave them um, a piece of information. It was a poll, and the poll suggested a Trump victory. And they asked them, okay, look at this poll now. Who do you think is going to win after we showed you this information? What they found was that the Trump supporters, they changed their predictions quite, quite quickly. They said, oh, well, in that case, I think maybe he has a really good chance. While the Clinton supporters, on the other hand, didn't change their mind that much. They said, yeah, we don't believe that poll. We still think she's probably going to win. So that's a case where the evidence confirmed what, uh, disconfirmed what the Trump supporters believed but it was what they wanted to believe. And so the optimism bias outweigh the confirmation bias in that case. People believe what they want to. They'll take in information because they want to. And sorry, I've just, uh, we've got an anonymous uh, attendee here who I don't know if one of the older people that you mentioned is having a strong optimism bias, but they're asking, how many more years can I buy myself with the optimism bias? Okay, so... <laughs> Of course, these are average, but, uh, oh, you mean in health. Sorry, I misunderstood it. In health or life. <laughs> it's a good question. You know what? I'm sure there's data out there that tell you on average how many years more. And I don't, off the top of my mind, don't know what the average is. But here's the interesting thing. You know, so the studies show overall optimistic individuals um, survive longer. Um, but it's possible that people who survive longer become up, are, are become more optimistic, right? We don't know what the causation um, it's the way around, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, Tally, thank you so much. And now I'm going to come to um, Alice, and uh, we're going to have uh, plenty to talk about because uh, I, I, you must be an optimistic person, surely. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Alice. Uh, you're a professional adventurer and author. Uh, you take risks for a living. Uh, you've um, cycled from Cape Town to Cairo. You've run the Marathon of the Sands. You've done the Everest Trail Race. Uh, you were the first woman to trek 15,000 kilometers of the Dra River in Morocco. Um, you've traveled tra uh, slave routes from Morocco to Timbuktu. Uh, and we've already had one audience question asking, why on earth do you do it? Well, I do. So first of all, I think I'm a bit like one of those frogs that you put in boiling water. And I'm... <laughs> I, you know, I warm up slowly. So I think the more things like this you do, the more you want to do them and the greater your tolerance grows. And I do think that is about certain kinds of risk. I would say I'm not a huge risk taker in some ways in that, you know, I don't want to end up dead because uh, I'm enjoying my life so much. Yeah. So I think I do things, I really try and think them through. But Tally, I have a very strong optimism bias. Mm. I am like Nelson, I'm like, I see no ships, you know, that old story when he when he was confronted by the French fleet and he put the telescope up to his blind eye. I think in order to do what I do, I quite often deliberately 
frankly, look the other way from the risk. I'm aware it's there. I know it's there, but I'm just like, well, yes, okay, that has happened, but I don't think it's going to happen to me. So I think that is a necessary kind of characteristic for what I do. And I'm lucky because we live in what I'm doing at the moment is trying to explore the world, um, specifically my region, which is North Africa, um, Middle East, Africa. And of course, I live in an era which is much safer than those who went before me. So I went to Timbuktu, um, but one of my great heroes who, who was the first European to get to Timbuktu, he got to Timbuktu after something like 23 explorers had been murdered on the way already. He got in there and then he got murdered on the way out. <laughs> he thought it wasn't going to happen to him. <laughs> but yeah. Alice, can I, can I butt in here, Alice? Because yes. um, I think one of the factors Paul discovered that influences risk is whether you've chosen the risk. Am I, am I right, Paul, on that one? Uh, yes. Uh, yep. It's yeah. under your control and it's voluntary. Yes. So, so I, Alice, does I that make a difference to you? Yeah. It does. I think you do choose risk. And I think if, if you can control it, it's good. But I think you also, if you if you decide to do something that is a bit risky, so say you're on a mountain bike and you're at the top of the mountain and you're like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going. There is a point when, frankly, with my level of skill, I'm no longer in control. <laughs> I've but taken you have to go mountain biking. Yeah, I've decided to go mountain bike. I've actually decided to take that route down the mountain, which is a bit too hard for me. But there is a point where I'm no longer in control. So I agree with you, Paul. I think when you choose the risk, it's fine. And I think, Sarah, we discussed when COVID happened, I, I mm. chose to fly back to Morocco just at the very beginning. So I flew back to Morocco on the 14th of March and our borders actually shut on the 15th of March. And the very beginning of the pandemic, I was nervous, I was scared, I was frightened. And the two things that frightened me were that something would happen to my parents who are elderly and in Scotland. And second thing was that um, the population would turn against me because I live in a small Amazir village. I'm extremely visible. I'm the only Euro one of two Europeans here. Um, and COVID came from Europe to Morocco. So I was worried about that possibility being a very visible stranger in times when you don't know how people are actually going to react because it's never happened to us before. Um, so I think the risk that I took then, what I spent my time doing was, was worrying about whether I'd made the right choice. And I don't know if Paul and Tally can speak to that because what really concerned me is, did I choose correctly? Should I have stayed in Scotland? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> but, well, I don't know if either of you want to tackle that or shall I steam on a bit more? Well, I think it's based on her preferences, right? Um, but my, I think my thing is, I think often what you regret or what you worry about is that you made a wrong choice. So when you choose a risk, you choose it and off you go. But then you do worry about, did I take the right choice? That you, you have that kind of buyer's regret sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, when you make a choice, what you think about is the outcomes. What will the outcomes be? And then the probability that these outcomes will come about. And each outcome has a value to you. So you think if I stay, this will happen, you know, this can happen or this can happen and this can happen. This is quite good for me. This is quite bad. You multiply that by the probability that you think it's going to happen, which is where risk comes about, right? The, the, the huge differences that we have between people is their estimate of how likely are these specific events to happen? Um, but also there's differences in how you value these things, right? How good or bad you think these, these things are. And, and we have biases in all these domains. Um, but interestingly, I mean, often, and this is not always the case, but, but I mean, there is a huge phenomenon by which once you make a choice, you tend to straight away reevaluate the options and rationalize that you made a good, a good choice. And I feel like it didn't happen this time, so it doesn't always happen. But but often people will make a choice and then they get more committed to the chosen action. Uh, but that's especially true when they can't go back. Meaning when I make a choice and I can't change it, like voting, I vote and I don't have an opportunity to change it. Um, then I tend to rationalize my choice and think that it was really good. But perhaps in this case, you have an opportunity to change, meaning at any point in time, you can get on a plane and go back. So maybe that's interfering with your ability to rationalize your choice as the best one and to move on to your next decision. 
And Alice, there's a great uh, question here. It came in before the event from Nina. She says, I think it's a good one for you. She said, what's a quick and effective way to calm down when shock or fear is coursing through you? Um, well, it, if the shock and fear is for a good reason. So for example, I got caught in quicksand and you need that shock and fear because you need it to adrenalize you to get the heck out of there. So if you need the shock and fear, use it and do what it's telling you to do. But if the shock and fear is inhibiting you from taking positive action, so for example, if you need to get down a mountain and because you're too scared to walk, I think you sit down immediately, you slow your breathing, you just stop, just immediately stop whatever you're doing and take a break, pause until you can go. That's lovely. Thank you. That's really terrific. Now, I, I'm, I'm stopping you there because I'd like us all to have a chance to chat a bit together and for us to take some of the questions that have been going coming through here. Um, a lot of the questions we've been getting are about personal development and people seem to be really interested in knowing uh, a little bit more on a, on a personal level before we move into anything on a societal level. Uh, there's a question from Stephen saying, is there a way that the analytical mind, the analytic mind can, can be brought to work in synchrony with the emotional and intuitive mind to make a more accurate or unified judgment? Do Does anyone in the panel have anything to say about that? Maybe wave your arm or something at me. Yes, Paul. Right, good question. I think one of the, the, uh, the first things to do in this, to make this happen is to slow down, to force yourself not, you know, uh, to, to pause, to th uh, think uh, carefully about what, what's in front of you that you're dealing with, as opposed to uh, going quickly with your, with your gut reaction. So the, the tendency is to, is to immediately uh, you know, use your instinct and intuition to respond to the situation. Uh, but we find that, that if, you know, if you're aware of the fact that uh, that this can can uh, mislead you and be problematic. Uh, stop, pause, uh, slow down, think a little bit about uh, what are the possible consequences. You know, try to kind of uh, visualize the consequences a little more. Uh, you know, even that 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 short pause can can bring the analytic side uh, into the picture in ways that wouldn't happen if you just respond with your instinctive immediate response. And is that then an either or, or is it possible the fact that you, you've had your instinct and then you're bringing your analytic side in, can you actually begin to integrate those? Well, I think that they, that they uh, are integrated. That is, even when you, when you slow down and you become uh, analytic and like scientific, and you may even you know, look at, at data and, and listen to the scientists, uh, in the end, you're responding also to your feelings. That is, after you do an analysis, you then uh, ask yourself, does this feel right or wrong? Or does, you know, what? So, so the feelings come in there too. They come in at the back end as opposed to in the immediate front end when you're doing the, the, uh, the intuitive thinking. So, so uh, your feelings are always there uh, to, uh, to guide you. You just have to give them a chance uh, to do it in a careful way. Just to say that in, in terms of the brain, um, it, there aren't really two different systems that are disconnected. I think there's um, a little bit of a kind of a misperception of that. Um, you know, our emotion, our arousal signals, that, you know, the deep regions in our brain, such as the amygdala, are very strongly connected to the frontal lobes. Um, there are projections going back and forth all the time. So um, it's not two disconnected systems, neurologically speaking, and any other way as well. And also to say that uh, we shouldn't disregard our intuitions or our like gut feelings, right? What they are is they're simply um, feeling is actually an assessment of what's in front of us. Um, based on a lot of experiences, and it gives us good information, right? Emotions are there for a good reason. We would not be in a good place if we didn't have emotions, if we didn't have feelings. So it's not, they are giving us extremely good information, and we are mm -hmm. um, as likely to be biased um, by, you know, rational thinking, so to speak, as we are by just following our intuition. 
so it, sometimes what I find is that people have a gut feeling for a good reason because there's a lot of information that we com that comes in and we don't know exactly why it gives us a negative feeling. But our brain assesses, for example, people's uh, facial expressions, expressions really fast. So for example, if you have a negative, if something feels bad and you're not sure why, you're, there's probably a reason. Your brain is probably telling you that someone is lying to you, right? Something is a bit odd and you don't know why, but the brain does a lot of processing under the radar. Um, and that information I feel can sometimes be dismissed because you're saying, well, I don't have a reason to suspect this person. So why is that? I, I probably, there's probably a, not a good reason for it. And we tend to dismiss that. So both uh, signals are important and they are connected as well. Alice, do you tend to go with your gut for your brain or both? Um, they are I, probably honest, honestly, both. Uh, as I said, if there's a reason, I do try and listen to intuition, especially with regards to danger. Um, just a very simple one on the London Underground, I can think of three exact incidences when I'm sure I was being followed. And in all three times, I was absolutely right. And they led to kind of unpleasant things. So I think you should, I, I agree with Tally. I think you, you have to listen to it. But Paul, I'm with you totally. As I say, if, if, there's, if you need to progress and your fear is stopping you, you, you have to stop. And sometimes the best thing you can do is do nothing. So you do have to listen to both sides of your voices going on in your head like that. Sometimes they say different things. There's, there's a good question from Martin. Uh, is it possible for us to exist without fear? If so, how to attain that condition? I guess it's, is risk useful? It's a way of saying I'm, I'm assuming. Or is fear useful? Anyone want to answer that one? Well, I'm, can I answer in a very odd way? Because on this expedition I've just done, we, we've got six camels and I've been with three Amazir men. And often when we stopped in villages, the women would hand us their babies to pass under the belly of the camel because they believe here that if you pass your baby under the belly of a camel or if you pass under the belly of a camel, you will fear nothing for the rest of your life. So maybe it's a good thing. And sorry, there's someone else asking something similar. Uh, Glenn is saying, is there a way to choose and harness risk to increase motivation to taking action? So again, it's sort of, can risk be useful in some ways? Well, we certainly have to take risk often, right? I mean, um, in order, to, I mean, moving forward is trying new things, right? In order to develop, you have to try new things. And because something is new, we are sometimes, we don't know what are the potential outcomes um, and what is the probability of a negative outcome. Um, but often, you know, moving forward includes taking some risk. And just going back to this fear question, there are actually people who don't have um, an amygdala. So the amygdala is part of the brain. You have two of them in each part of your brain, uh, about the size of a cherry tomato that is important for signaling emotion, arousal, very important for signaling fear. And some people don't have that. Uh, for a neurological condition. And what you see with these individuals is that they don't have the feeling of fear, but they still can assess it. So that means they know they shouldn't um, cross the road where the car is coming, but they don't feel fear at all. Um, and, and that actually is not a good thing, right? Um, because it's a little bit more difficult for them to stop. And in fact, what fear does it actually usually say, people say uh, flight or fight, but in fact, the first thing fear does, it actually causes you to freeze automatically. You don't have to think about it. The first reaction is freezing. So when we think that a negative outcome is about to happen, it actually causes us inaction um, and it reduces our likelihood to, to act. We can overcome that, of course, later, but. That, that's great. So in a way, it's a bit like pain, it sounds. And I'm uh, sorry, moving on to uh, a good question from Jordan, who says, what should the posture of a parent of independent young children be to teaching about the dangers of the world? And I'm a, I'm a parent of independent young children, so I'm very interested in knowing, knowing the answer to that. <laughs> I certainly find my kids have got the optimism bias quite, quite badly, got quite a bad case of it. Has anyone got kids on the panel that would like to comment on what how they how they did things? Because it's sort of a balance between trying to warn them and not terrify the life out of them, isn't it? Yes, I, I think you know it's good to um, have your kids be optimistic. 
Um, it's very much related to success and happiness. Um, so that's, that's a very good thing. It, it's also related to a sense of control. Uh, people who have a sense that they have agency tend to be more optimistic. So, so this is, is a good thing to have. Um, and I think in order to make sure that your kids are um, not taking too much risk, uh, perhaps some, some rules are good to put, to put in place. Boundaries. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll leap in there as well because I've declared that I've got kids. So what we do, we, I said we live in a very rural area. There's quite a lot of hazards here. And we tend to do a sort of little risk assessment and try and gauge, you know, if they're going to fall off a you know, little wall or something like that, are they going to graze their knee or are they going to break their neck? And if, if they're going to graze their knee, we quite often just let them do it. Um, if they're going to break their neck, I'm usually running. They're going, no, stop. Well, I, I think that sports are a good way to, uh, to, uh, to teach kids, you know, the, uh, the benefits of taking chances, but also, uh, you know, responding to the realities of situations that you, 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 uh, do things and sometimes you fail, you take a chance, you fail, you've got outcomes that, uh, that uh, hone your sense of, uh, of uh, capabilities and limitations. Uh, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's one element that is useful in this regard. Now, questions are still um, flooding in, but I want to try and move us on a little bit because I'd like to be able to cover one or two more uh, areas reasonably fast. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest in the complex threats that are facing societies now. And I suppose uh, uh, um, a good one is the pandemic. Uh, David is asking, are you thinking of, explore, can you explore specific examples like the current pandemic or the polarization in the UK elections, for example? And uh, I'd, I'd add one of my own as well, if I may, which is climate change. Um, for instance, there's a huge difference, it seems to me, in how the world's reacted to COVID and to climate change. And can anyone shed any light on that? Uh, Paul? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, that there's actually a similarity between the way we react uh, to COVID and, and climate change uh, with, that is uh, linked to the fact that, that uh, COVID uh, spreads uh, exponentially. Uh, one person, uh, gets COVID, they uh, are likely to, to uh, infect more than one other person. Let's say they infect two people. And so, and each of those two people infect two more. So it grows from one to two to four to, you know, uh, and to six to eight and so forth. That's called an exponentially increasing uh, curve of, of infection. And, um, and, the, the thing about that is the human mind does not easily grasp exponential growth. And there's very uh, uh, nice experiments that demonstrate that, that when shown data that are increasing exponentially, you project in a linear way and you, and, and, you know, it starts very slowly. And so you, you just keep uh, projecting kind of this slow growth when an exponential function is something that it, it, it perks along slowly and then it leaps up and explodes and overwhelms you faster than you think. And, and so the analogy to climate change is that many of the processes that are changing the climate um, and, and the impacts themselves are also growing exponentially. Uh, the, the time frame is a little bit longer, but the exponential um, nature is still the same. And what that means is that we're still at a relatively low level uh, on this uh, exponential um, curve, but but that it will uh, accelerate and and hit us quicker than we think. So just like uh, around the world, governments were slow to react to uh, to COVID. They, they they delayed action when when early action is really the best way to to control it. Uh, we are delaying action on climate change. So I think there's a direct parallel, and they and it both and it's linked to the failure of the human mind to easily grasp exponential growth when it's responding with fast uh, intuitive thinking. The remedy there is that we are smart enough using slow analytic thinking to understand exponential growth. Our scientists uh, understand it. They're telling it, they're warning us, we need to listen to them. Do you, do you think being, a, being democracies actually works against us in this because Politicians are really listening to uh, people, voters' emotional brains rather than the analysts. 
Well, uh, it can go either way. It depends. It depends on who who our leaders are and what they want. So in the United States, uh, we have a democracy, but it but it is being run in a non-democratic way where where the, the government did not want to acknowledge the reality of of of, uh, of COVID for their own uh, political reasons. And so it went the, you know, it, it's been very, uh, uh, so it's been a catastrophe because of that. So um, I want to then move a little bit on from that because Paul, uh, I, I hear your words on climate change and you've also been very, very involved in uh, trying to raise awareness of human compassion uh, uh, and overcome the p- uh, obstacles in p- risk perception in order for us to have a more compassionate society. You touched on that in your interview, but I'd love to throw it open to the, the panel a bit, have a talk a bit more about it and really try and work out from what we've heard today about how we assess and perceive risk, what lessons can we draw? How can we make society better? How can we be better people, if you like? Maybe to, to, oh, to, to give such a, a little bit of a good news here, because um, it, 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 it suggests a little bit of a bleak view of society. I think, uh, um, in fact, data suggests that people are empathetic and do care about um, other people's risk and uh, other people's outcomes. We see this, in fact, with the COVID data, our data suggests that people are engaging in behavioral measures to mitigate risk, mostly for other people, not for themselves. They're underestimating their own risk, but they are actually seeing correctly the risk to the population. And that is the factor that is most likely to predict whether they put on a mask, they social distance, and so on and so forth. So they're doing this for other people. And the success, I think, in the UK of the slogan, stay home, save lives, save the NHS, is also uh, something that supports this idea that uh, people really care about saving other people and saving lives and so on. Uh, maybe it's surprising to some, and you know, the data was so strong that it was surprising to me, um, but, but it, it is there and perhaps our inability to see the risk in our for ourselves, but our ability to see risk for others is something that is kicking in here. So we have what's called the bias blind spot. We have a we we can't see the biases in ourselves, and we aren't estimating risk for ourselves, but we can see um, it for other people, and it is changing our behavior. But those other people have to be around and have to be there. So that's that where climate change and COVID is is very different, right? The risk of COVID is to people now around us and some, to some degree to ourselves. Uh, the risk of climate change is mostly to future generations, mostly, right? The really big negative outcomes are there waiting for us in the way in the future, most likely um, not for ourselves. Um, and I think that is a huge problem, a huge difference between COVID and climate change. That is time and, and people that are not around us mostly. So, so it, that's very heartening, at least about the altruism. And we managed to get back to the very first question that I read out at the wrong time about how we can get people to wear masks. It sounds like you've answered that one too. So that that is is quite um, hopeful. And Paul, how how about you? I know you've done a lot of work on this too. Well, um, I'm I'm a little less uh, optimistic. Uh, uh, with regard to COVID and also the major problems facing uh, society and, and the world. But with regard to, to COVID, there are other factors, behavioral factors that are Im- important, um, such as the fact that, that the, uh, following the recommended safety guidelines uh, we, you know, will erode over time. That is, uh, when we first learn about what we're supposed to do, we all you know, eagerly uh, embrace those guidelines and you know, uh, shelter in place and, and keep distance and wear masks. Uh, and, but over time, those, those uh, behaviors tend to, to erode because we don't see an immediate benefit from doing that. Uh, we don't see who we're protecting or, uh, uh, or, or harming. We, we, we don't, um, but we feel a cost. You know, we can't do things with our friends. Uh, we can't uh, uh, go to the workplace like we, we need to do and so forth. So we, we don't see an immediate benefit. We feel an immediate cost if, from doing the recommended thing, guidelines. If we, if, we, if we don't do those, follow the guidelines, 
we feel an immediate benefit. We get to do the things we want to do, and we don't feel an immediate cost to doing that. So the reinforcement uh, principles are just the opposite to maintain that behavior over time. And so that's what we see is that people start out uh, you know, doing the recommended uh, uh, safety uh, protocols, and then they relax over time and, and stop doing that. The only way then the, to deal with that is you have to have an overarching kind of uh, enforcement uh, uh, system that, that, uh, that will mandate or require these behaviors, at least uh, to get the virus under control and, to, and, and will, will impose costs on people or punishments if they don't do that, at least in the short term. Because without doing that in the short term, you're not going to uh, get the virus under control. The economist, economy cannot really fully rebound. So you have to take into account the behavioral uh, elements as well as the, uh, the, uh, the medical uh, uh, aspects of the disease. And interestingly, the new task force that uh, uh, President-elect Biden has just created, 13 member task force in the United States to, uh, to oversee uh, the, uh, the fight against COVID does not include any behavioral scientists. It's only medical uh, people. You need to take uh, behavior and perception into account in, in developing and implementing your policies. Mm, thank you. And uh, I just want to take, we maybe had time only for one or two more questions. Phil is asking uh, from the audience, uh, it seems to me we've become increasingly risk averse as a society. How do we deal with the tyranny of the increasing number of health and safety rules and regulations? And I should say that we're hoping to have in this series an interview with uh, a guy called Matthew Crawford, who has written about what he calls safetyism and the fact that risk is perhaps a creative force. And if you eliminate risk, do you eliminate, you know, sources of development uh, and means of creativity, personal growth? Not perhaps the pandemic, but, you know, in, in it, just within society. Alice? Well, I'm, a I mean, I'm hugely in favour of people taking some level of risk and actually taking risk. And, and, and I do think physically, if you start taking risks, you can learn to be braver, as I've said. And I do think then you reap the rewards. So yes, I think we are in a risk averse world. I, I see people with their children, um, especially in the cities, they won't let them do this, they won't let them do that, they won't let them do this, they want them to do this. It's like, guys, you know, your kids, your, your approach of let them fall off the wall if it's only gonna graze their knees. I do think we need to learn to understand the consequences of risk and thereby by understanding the consequence, i.e. if I jump off this wall, I'm gonna hurt myself, we can then avoid a more dangerous scenario in the future and by mollycoddling ourselves and by mollycoddling those around us and I'm saying mollycoddling because it's a nice nasty word um provocative word I do think we are doing ourselves absolutely no favors I and I think as well what plays into that at the moment is is this this idea that the self matters very 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 much the individual matters hugely and society matters secondly. So I'm not gonna do something that harms my health, but society matters a bit less. And I, I see that a lot with the way the language people use about I'm working on myself. Alice, um, thank you. Thank you, sorry. I'm just cutting you a little bit short because I'm seeing that our time is hitting about an hour now. And I, I, I would love just to get a little wind up thought perhaps from all three of you just on, um, uh, because there's been such an appetite, I think, from the audience in this hour for improvement of self and of society and philosophy and psychology. If there's anything your experience or your research into risk has taught you as to how we can be better, do it better, uh, please just give me a little, a little comment, each of you. Um, I don't know who would like to start, Paul? You look like you're <laughs> well i think that again another key factor is risk as we've seen in the discussion is is complex it's complicated you know it's a, it's a mix of science and emotion and politics and culture uh, i think the the best way is to uh, inform oneself uh, about uh, what is known about how we uh, think about risk how we should think about risk uh, inform oneself inform others uh, 
listen, listen to, uh, to the experts, uh, uh, participate with organizations that are uh, addressing the problems of concern with you. There's a, another thing we didn't touch upon at all today was efficacy, the feeling of that, the, that what you do, do makes a difference. And that's a motivator too. And you can multiply your own efficacy by joining uh, kindred spirits in effective organizations to deal with the uh, risks that you're concerned about. So it's a very complex topic that we've just uh, seen the kind of the tip of the iceberg today and uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this in this session. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Tali, do you have a, a final thought? Um, well, perhaps um, do try new things. Uh, there are some risk in new things, but new thing, trying new things is the only way that we could actually develop uh, forward. So whether it is moving to a new place for a while, um, or trying new foods, or um, speaking to people that you haven't spoken to ever, just uh, trying new things is, is a good way to take a little bit of risk, but uh, the kind of risk that actually can really help you evolve and develop. And Alice, just in a few words, tiny, tiny thought. Um, if what's stopping you from doing something new, taking a risk is what other people think of you, don't worry about it. They're not thinking about you. They're probably more interested in what they're doing. So don't worry about it. Just do it. That's a very good one. And uh, maybe a, a more or less last word from, from a member of the audience. Jack has just reminded me of a quote from uh, the Persian poet uh, Sadi of Shiraz. Uh, in the sea are treasures beyond compare, but if you seek safety, it is on the shore. Um, so thank you so much for our entire to our entire panel and to all the audience. Um, please keep looking out uh, uh, on our website and at, at the newsletter. We're going to have some other information. We hope uh, we've already got an interview by the renowned statistician uh, Professor Sir David David uh, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter and uh, also the risk analyst, uh, David Ropique. And we're hoping, as I said, soon to be doing an interview with Matthew Crawford about safetyism. That's something that quite a few of you seem to be very interested in, the idea that abolishing risk uh, as a society might also mean abolishing the opportunity for creativity. Um, I've been so inspired by all of your ideas today. Thank you so much. A Alice, thank you for your brilliant story of the triumphs of the human spirit and uh, Tali for your insights into the superpower of optimism and, uh, um, uh, and Paul for your uh, just wonderful argument that we do have a conscious choice and we can uh, extend our own humanity if you like if, I, if I've understood you right and uh, maybe do something to change ourselves and to our world and finally please do keep your ideas coming. Um, let us know how you're doing. If you're trying to change your the way you view risk or assess risk or the parts of your brain you're trying to use, just keep um, uh, communicating with us. Uh, we're really interested to hear from you. Thank you all very, very much and good night. <laughs>